morning, everyone. It is seven o'clock in the UK. Welcome, wherever you're watching us around the world this morning. New set of traffic lights. Summer holidays are back on the horizon, but with a note of caution, with holiday islands put on a new green watch list that could see them switch to amber. We'll ask the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, about that in just a moment. And the new travel freedoms heading for some, but only if you've had two jabs. We'll speak to the boss of Ryanair as airlines rush to put on extra flights, with some accused of ramping up prices. Also... I know, I was trying not to do that as well. Uh, we'll go live to the real-life Club Tropicana, preparing to welcome back British holidaymakers to Ibiza. We'll speak to the creative director of the Ibiza Rocks Hotel. And... One Britain, one nation. We'll talk to the former police officer who wants all schools to learn shared values of kindness and respect through the medium of music. It's Friday, the 25th of June. Green light, but a warning. The holiday islands that have just been made quarantine-free travel destinations are at risk of moving from green to amber. Grab a jab. Football stadia, theatres and supermarkets become walk-in centres as anyone over the age of 18 can now get a vaccine without booking. I hear about the cases going up um, massively in the UK and so on that side I, I worry for people. A bit premature why Lewis Hamilton is concerned about a full house at the British Grand Prix. A survivor is pulled from the rubble of a collapsed apartment building in Miami as President Biden declares a state of emergency. We'll be live in Miami as his families wait for news about the 99 people still missing. The blood test that can detect 50 types of cancer to be trialled by the NHS. And a much colder day across northern areas with spells of rain, brighter and warmer in the south, but also some heavy showers. I'll have the details for you later. Good morning, everybody. This Friday morning, summer holidays may be back on, but there's a warning this morning over the holiday islands that have been added to the green travel list. Malta the Balearic Islands and a number of Caribbean destinations such as Barbados have been put on a green watch list, which the government says means they're at risk of switching from green to amber. So people should take extra care when thinking about travelling to those holiday hotspots. Plans too to give people who've had two jabs more freedoms. So the government says it plans to allow fully vaccinated people in England to travel to an amber list country without having to quarantine on their return by later this summer. Malta, Madeira and Spain's Balearic Islands make up the European countries to be added to the green travel watch list. A number of Caribbean islands, including Antigua, Barbados, Grenada, uh, have also been added, along with other overseas UK territories, including Anguilla, Bermuda and the Cayman Islands, as Laura Bondock reports. Wish you were here? You could be very soon. The Balearic beaches are back on the green list. And that's what Ina and her much-missed Mallorcan family hope to hear. So relieved. It's amazing. My daughter, you might hear her, but she is jumping up and down on, on her bed. <laughs> So it looks like the ceiling might fall. Um, it is a huge relief. It means um, it, it just, it, it, it feels almost like it's over. And there's more good news for holiday hopefuls. The government says the double vaccinated will have extra travel freedoms, but we don't know when. No decisions until next month, leaving the travel industry once more in limbo. Certainty is really important. We know from talking to our customers, they're just confused, they're worried, they're nervous, and they just want that certainty that if they book something, they will be able to travel. And it's going to take a little bit of time to get there, but the more that the government can do to create that certainty, the better. Most of the new green list countries have been added to the green watch list. That means they're at risk of being downgraded. And that makes booking a getaway a gamble. 
with the current variant being quite high, I just feel that it's probably not safe. I personally wouldn't travel yet, not probably till next year. Since there's very little risk if you're double jabbed, from what I understand, either of you're getting sick or of you're infecting somebody else, you should be able to travel and no quarantine. I think you just have to listen to what the government have got to say. Uh, presumably they've got good data. The trouble is the data changes, and that's why some feel we should hold off foreign holidays. The Delta variant's taking off in a big way, of course, in the UK, uh, and it's now showing real problems across Europe. My view is that this is a summer where we sh probably should stay at home, where uh, international travel should be kept to a minimum, and I think we'll be in a much, much better place come the autumn, and certainly by next spring. Our airports are quiet and there remain lots of questions about mass travel this summer. Are we nearly there yet? The answer, simply no. Laura Bundock, Sky News. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps is with us now. Mr Shapps, you get the badge for the most popular minister this morning. Why these countries in particular? Uh, well, we took the scientific advice of the Joint Biosecurity Centre. Um, they said these are the countries which uh, could now be moved to the, the green uh, list. That means that you can travel there. Uh, be aware there are still some things you'll need to do. You'll still need to test when you come home, for example. Um, but it does mean that there's a little bit of uh, relief, as you mentioned in that report, for the travel industry and, of course, for people who wish to get away. But it won't be quite like it was in the 2019, in the old days, but we're a move in a positive direction. OK, Balearix and Madeira, though, are on the watch list, amongst others, the green watch list. I mean, you more than most will know what it's like to get somewhere and then immediately have to come back and, and quarantine. Um, would you book a holiday to Mallorca at the moment? Yeah, so I should just explain the, the watch list, the green watch list. It means they're on the green list. It means you can go, uh, it's treated like a, a, a green list. But we're just being completely open with the data that the scientists have given us and say, in saying uh, there are one or two concerns. It might mean that we we have to perhaps respond quickly on there. So we've said it's the green watch list in order that people can see exactly what we're seeing uh, about it. And, and I do I have to say, whoever is booking um, to go anywhere this summer at all, uh, you, you know, travel insurance, making sure your, your flights are changeable, and making sure the accommodation is changeable, all those things are going to be very, very important this particular yeah. year. And I think, yeah. uh, you know, people will need to weigh up whether that is going to be work for them or not. Yeah, because, I mean, we saw what happened with Portugal, though, didn't we? And that was on the green list, the watch list, and that's flipped uh, in a heartbeat. So that my question again is, would you book a holiday for your family to one of the Balearic Islands at the moment, given that it's on a watch list? Yeah. So actually, they were just on the green um, list. And, and the reason we've introduced the using this watch list category is to give people a bit more visibility uh, over it if we think things might move uh, quicker. Um, so <laughs> sadly, I don't think I've got time at the moment to um, take a holiday. Um, but, um, uh, you know, if people are in a situation where uh, from uh, next week, from next Wednesday, Thursday, uh, they wanted to get away, then this, these are the places where you can go for the purposes of, of holiday of course, being aware of all the uh, caveats about uh, the, the risk of things changing, because in this virus, we know that happens with uh, quite a lot of regularity. I know you're impossibly busy and we uh, appreciate you taking the time to join us, but would you book a holiday to Mallorca if you were less busy at well, the moment? Well, as I say, I, I, you're asking me if I, if I was in someone else's shoes. And I'm not. I, I'm not uh, looking to go on holiday right this moment um, because I'm uh, I'm rather busy dealing with this and, and a lot of other transport issues. Um, but so each individual will look at their own situation. I'm not trying to fudge your question. Each individual will look at their own situation. And, and if people have flexibility, then that obviously is going to be a bit easier this year. Uh, if people want, um, you know, more surety, there are uh, there are some, although a limited number of locations which are just on the green list. They don't have the the watch list list tag uh, after it, people will have to come to their own decisions. And I think most people realise that after having gone through coronavirus for what is now uh, the second full summer. I guess Angela Merkel's not your uh, best friend at the moment, is she? She wants all UK visitors to quarantine when they arrive in the EU. 
No, look, I understand that uh, Germany doesn't have the same level of uh, vaccinations as, as has happened in this country. So they'll be particularly uh, concerned. Each country will have to come to their own decision. A country like Malta, which has a very high level of uh, vaccination, haven't said the same thing. Uh, and other European countries will come to their own decisions. And I think I respect that. That's for, the, for them to do. Um, but it is different in each country and, and largely driven by levels of vaccination that they've managed to achieve in each country. OK, those that are lucky enough to have had two jabs, um, what sort of benefits might they be expecting a little bit further down the road? Yeah, that's the other thing I flagged up yesterday, which is we've met with the scientists and we've discussed this. And uh, we think that later in the summer, if you've had both vaccinations, then we may well be able to treat uh, a location which is currently an amber in the middle there, a list country, as if it were a green list country from the point of view of a double or fully vaccinated uh, individual. So that means you'd be able to come back, uh, take the single test, which is what you have with the green, and not have to quarantine. Um, I, we need more information and data on this, and there are some difficult issues to resolve as well with regard to you know what happens, for example, for children, for those who can't be vaccinated, and of course, giving everybody the opportunity to have those vaccinations. And if you're over 18 now, please book, please go and have your, your your first jab and get the second one when you're called. So there are a number of things that need to happen first, but I thought it was right to give people an indication of our sort of direction of travel, what we were seeing and, and what we think uh, might be possible. I'll say more about that next month. OK, I mean, I'm guessing that it would be perfect to dovetail that into the 19th of July Terminus Day, wouldn't it? Well, I think it's uh, unfortunately a bit more complicated than that. For example, we've got UK um, vaccination certificates. And if you download the regular NHS app, that's not the COVID one that you use to check in. It's just the normal NHS app. Uh, it will already it's already capable of displaying your vaccine certificate. It will show your vaccine status. Um, so that's easy for people who have UK uh, vaccinations. Uh, what do you do, for example, for a country um, that doesn't have any indication of vaccination um, status. <clears throat> and I'm thinking here of locations where, uh, for example, the United States, where I think they probably have 50 different systems, uh, and much of which is paper-based in different states. So uh, there are complications in terms of how you would accept other people's vaccination certification. And those are the things that we'll be working through, uh, which I imagine will take longer than the 19th of July, uh, particularly for people traveling from other countries here. Yeah. So we'll, we'll probably focus in phase one on UK vaccinated people who've been double vaccinated uh, and what that means for their travel into amber areas. OK, so it's looking more like August, really, isn't it? Well, as I say, I, I, you're, you're, you're preempting something which I just don't know the answer to, and I want to be completely upfront uh, with you about that, not least because the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisations have yet to opine on whether children should or shouldn't have vaccinations, for example, and that's one of the very big areas, is what do you do uh, if children are not going to be uh, getting vaccinations? So there's, there's quite a lot of um, interrelated and complicated decisions to make on this. I thought it was right just to give people an indication, and particularly the travel sector an indication, okay. that we are looking at this, we are working with the scientists on, on this, and we're thinking about how we could best apply it. And, and so just in the interest of being transparent about it, we're, we're, we're telling people uh, what we're thinking about, and that I'll come back next month and be able to say more on it. OK, Silverstone planning a capacity crowd for the British Grand Prix. Lewis Hamilton says he's worried about his fans that are in the stands. Why is he wrong to worry? Well, I think I, I, I just saw that story before I came on. I think that the most important thing, as with all of these, uh, this experimental program where we've been seeing numbers of, of crowds being able to attend uh, events, we need to follow the science uh, and see uh, what that's saying. So far, as I understand it, um, so good. There are tests done before on these programs, experimental programs. There are tests done a period afterwards to see what's happening and depending on the, the uh, environment, what's happening. So for example, obviously we know outdoor events are much better than indoor uh, events, for example, from, from the point of view of not spreading the virus. So uh, my, my simple answer is, let's follow the science. Let's see what that says and then, and then uh, be able to uh, open events uh, as per uh, the, the, uh, the opportunities to do so. Obviously we all want to get back to the uh, the world we, we used to live in, got we've it. got to do so safely. OK, got it. Um, so he needs to worry not. Uh, 19th of July, uh, George Eustace, when he was on the show the other day, and I think Rishi Sunak as well, has said that they're going to ditch their mask. Will you be doing the same? 
Well, I should say, actually, the government's carrying out uh, a review of what to do with what are called the non pharmaceutical measures. Uh, that's things like social distancing, things like wearing masks and the like. Uh, so I'm going to wait to sort of get the outcome of that, because again, it will be based on scientific information before I before I, uh, I sort of jump to uh, conclusions. Obviously, we're all desperate to sort of ditch the masks, but I think we want to wait for the science first before making a decision. But there is no legal compunction to wear a mask as after the 19th of July, which is why he says he's, um, certainly George Eustace, who I interviewed, said absolutely it's gone. Yeah, well, look, I, as I say, I, I, the, the whole point of setting up these reviews following the scientific data is to be able to advise people. As somebody I saw in the package you paid just before I came on very wisely said, let's wait and see what the technical and scientific advice uh, is. Let's wait and see what the government recommends, and then we'll be able to make a decision. Um, there are people who say they'll feel more comfortable, for example, on, on, uh, on transport if they keep the mask on. Other people say it should be removed. What I want to do is see what the science says. Uh, and make sure that we can all um, travel, go about our business as safely as possible. A bit more cautious then. Uh, now, um, I need to ask you about the Sun story this morning about the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. Uh, what are the rules about appointing friends to a position at the heart of government which may give them special access? Well, look, first of all, um, the, the, I think the actual issue is an entirely personal um, issue for uh, for Matt Hancock. Um, in terms of uh, rules, anyone who's been appointed has to go through an incredibly rigorous process in, in government. Um, so whatever the rules are, the rules will have to be followed. There are no shortcutting. Uh, that is anyone who's had anything to do with the appointment system in the civil service knows. Uh, there, there are very st strict uh, rules in place. Yeah, I mean, the, we spoke to the Department of Health this morning. They say this appointment was made in the usual way and followed correct procedure. What exactly? And also, is, some time ago, I don't think it's a What is that recent... procedure? So uh, it depends on the specific role, um, but uh, people have to go through usually an, an interview process which involves an independent panel. Recommendations are then made to uh, ministers. Uh, depending on the type of role, uh, you'll get a, 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 a something called appointable or non-appointable. Uh, list and then you make a decision uh, based on the qualifications of the uh, individual. So I don't think um, that uh, I, I, uh, I think it's a bit of a red herring in, in, in this case. I think it's really a, a, a personal story and it's not, so I don't intend to comment on somebody else's uh, personal life. Didn't ask you to. Um, I was just asking you about what the rules were as far as appointing people was concerned. And I, I suppose I, I would ask you finally, would you be comfortable appointing um, a, universe, a former university friend into your office? Well, I would only ever appoint somebody who's qualified for the role. Um, as I understand it, this individual was uh, more than qualified for the for, for the uh, role of advice being provided. As I say, beyond that, uh, I, I fear you tempt me into commenting on uh, personal matters. And uh, you know, the, the health sector's been working very hard rolling out this vaccine uh, program, uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, you were trying to leave the witness there. Uh, and I certainly wasn't asking you that, Mr. Shapps. I just wanted to know what the rules were. It's always sure, good sure. to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the programme. Thank Thanks. you. Still to come on the programme for you, speaking to the boss of one of Europe's biggest airlines, Michael O'Leary from Ryanair, as European holiday hotspots are added to the green list. The former Chancellor George Osborne prepares to take over at the British Museum. But should it hand back some of its treasures from other countries? We'll discuss that at 7.45. And I'm going to be chatting to former Hollyoaks actor Luke Jody about his new play highlighting the ease with which young men can turn to violence. That's at half past nine. Really tragic news coming out of the US this morning. 99 people are still missing after an apartment building collapsed in Miami in Florida. At least one person has died in the collapse yesterday morning. The cause still unclear. Uh, excuse me, our US correspondent Martha Kellner reports. This is what remains of a 12-storey apartment block on Florida's Atlantic coast. It happened while they were sleeping at 1.30 a.m., People nearby thought it could have been a piercing crack of thunder. The truth was far more traumatic. A CCTV camera capturing the moment the building came down, with no warning for the dozens of people inside. Apartment units ripped in two by the force. Lives torn apart. Sky News has been told that a British woman, 38-year-old Bhavna Patel, who is pregnant, is missing. So too are her husband, Vishal, and one-year-old daughter, Aishani. 
Their close friend is struggling to comprehend what has happened to this family. Bhavna was an angel. She was a sweet, kind, loving woman. They were they're, they're just, just God sent, you know, and I guess God came back for his angels, you know. And I, the kids, so mine. Mm. There were 134 apartment units in this building. More than half were destroyed. Hope was briefly ignited as this young boy was rescued from the rubble by firefighters who began work despite the risk of the entire building collapsing. But unable to penetrate the debris from above, a rescue team took their efforts below ground, battling conditions in a car park, trying to locate any voids where survivors may be. Rescuers said at one point they heard a sound of knocking from the wreckage. For the families here, any news like that is a glimmer of light on the darkest of days. But this search is likely to be long and for many here, utterly agonising. A local state of emergency was declared here as rescue teams continued through the night, sifting through the wreckage of a building which housed many international residents. Sofia Lopez Moreira, sister of Paraguay's first lady, and her husband are among the missing. This is a tragedy without precedent in the United States of America. Uh, the, the devastation that, that, that I witnessed today is, is the likes of which I've never seen, and I have been to Haiti and other, other nations. It's a community of families, retirees, and holiday makers. The inquiry into why this building came down with such devastating consequence has already begun. Martha's with us. She's at a community centre in Miami where families are desperately waiting for the news. Hello to you, Martha. I can't begin to imagine uh, how they must be feeling. What's it like now? It's fairly horrific, to be honest, Kay. It's a scene of utter desperation inside this community centre in Surfside. Now, Surfside is a community which is around six miles north of Miami Beach, which people at home may be more familiar with. Surfside, as the name suggests, is a place where the beach is the focus of everyday life. And in fact, I was speaking to, to a close friend of Bhavna Patel, the 38-year-old British woman who you saw in that report who's missing, along with her husband and her one-year-old daughter. Their friend was telling me that Bhavna moved her young family into the Champlain Towers apartment, the block that collapsed, because it had such a beautiful view of the white sandy beach and the Atlantic Ocean beyond. Never could they have imagined that they'd be at the centre of such a tragedy. And Bhavna's family are now in this community centre behind me. It's been repurposed as a reunification centre. There's around 40 to 50 families and friends of the 99 people still unaccounted for inside there waiting for news um, from the search and rescue teams. That search and rescue operation is still ongoing. It's been hampered not only by the difficult conditions above ground and the huge debris, the flooding underneath ground where they're trying to get up, but also the unpredictable Florida weather in June. They're hoping that daybreak brings better news and possible survivors in that wreckage. OK, Martha, thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Absolutely tragic. Um, also coming up for you this morning, uh, hundreds of walk-in vaccination sites will be operating this weekend with all adults urged to turn up and grab a jab. Anyone aged 18 or over can turn up at the sites, which include football stadia, theatres and supermarket car parks. Almost 32 million people in the UK have now received both doses of a coronavirus vaccine. Scientists say a blood test that can detect more than 50 types of cancer before any clinical signs or symptoms of the disease is accurate enough to be rolled out as a screening test. The test, which is due to be piloted by NHS England, is aimed at people at higher risk of the disease, such as patients over 50. Researchers found the test correctly identified when cancer was present in more than 51% of cases across all stages of the disease. It wrongly detected cancer in less than 1% of cases. The test also identified the tissue in which the cancer was located in almost 90% of cases. The NHS pilot will involve 165,000 patients with the results expected by 2023.
Experts have warned that A&E departments are being flooded with children with often mild fevers, creating a winter in June for the NHS. As lockdown eases, more children are coming into contact with viruses usually seen in the winter months. And now three royal colleges have issued guidance for parents after seeing a large rise in numbers seeking emergency help for conditions that are not COVID. Almost 600 million COVID tests handed out in England may have gone unused. The National Audit Office says 96 million lateral flow tests have been registered with NHS Test and Trace, just 14% of the 691 million distributed. The cost of Test and Trace was put at £13.5 billion by the last financial year. Pop star Britney Spears has written on social media about her efforts to challenge a conservatorship order. She posted on Instagram about the case 24 hours after she told a judge the order effectively forced her to work. The legal agreement has been in place since 2008, with Britney's father in control of her career and her finances. Britney decided to share this quote from Einstein. If you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. She also had a message for her followers. I just want to tell you guys a little secret. I believe as people, we all want the fairy tale life. And by the way, I've posted my life seems to be and look be pretty amazing. I also apologize for pretending like I've been okay the past two years. I did it because of my pride and I was embarrassed to share what happened to me. Believe it or not, pretending that I'm OK has actually helped. So I decided to post this quote today. Time now for a look at the morning's newspapers for you. And foreign holidays, confusion deepens. The Telegraph reports that ministers are accused of making summer travel more complex. The Guardian says there's a cabinet rift over plans to grant more travel freedoms to those who have received both doses of a coronavirus vaccine. But the Mail is upbeat, declaring that summer getaways have been saved. On its front page, The Sun has a story about the health secretary, Matt Hancock. And The Star reports on the diplomatic standoff involving the Royal Navy and Russia near Crimea on Wednesday. What's happening as far as the weather is concerned today and indeed for the weekend, it's Friday, yay! Here's Naz, good morning. Good morning. Well, big temperature drop, Kay, for northern areas of the UK today where it will be rather cloudy and wet. For the south, warmer but with some heavy showers. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning. A big temperature drop across northern parts of the UK for today, mainly around parts of Scotland and North East England, where it's going to be cloudy, windy, cool and wet. In fact, this morning there are spells of rain across southern parts of Scotland, eastern Scotland too, and areas of northern England. Also showers across many parts of England and Wales. But uh, it is also mainly dry across Ireland, Northern Ireland and western parts of Scotland. Now, going into this afternoon, and we'll see most of that rain clear away eastwards, but it will continue across eastern Scotland, southern Scotland, northern England, and it will be rather windy across these areas. It's going to be a much colder day compared to yesterday. And that's due to northerly winds as well, bringing through that cool airflow, but still warm and actually quite humid across parts of England and Wales, where... There will be brighter sunny spells developing, but also the risk of some showers across Wales, the Midlands, Central and Eastern England. Mostly dry for Ireland and Northern Ireland. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. This morning, we bring you proof as if it was needed that dogs really are your best friend. Ambulance crews filmed these pictures as they took a woman to hospital in the Turkish capital of Istanbul. Her golden retriever wanted to ride with her to the hospital. It wasn't allowed into the ambulance. Look what he did. Look what he did. Determined not to be defeated, he followed her all the way to the front door of the hospital. Coming up in just a short time, I will be joined by the former Chief Medical Officer, Dame Sally Davis, to discuss prevention of future pandemics.
hello again. You're watching The Breakfast Programme here on Sky Friday morning. The Transport Secretary has warned tourists to be ready for future and further changes to international travel restrictions when planning their holidays. Malta, the Balearic Islands and a number of Caribbean destinations such as Barbados have been put on a green watch list, which the government says means they're at risk of switching to amber. Grant Shapps told this programme anyone going overseas needed to be prepared for the rules to change again. Whoever is booking um, to go anywhere this summer at all, uh, you, you know, travel insurance, making sure your, your flights are changeable, and making sure the accommodation is changeable, all those things are going to be very, very important this particular yeah. year. And I think, yeah. uh, you know, people need to weigh up whether that is going to be work for them or not. Yeah, because, I mean, we saw what happened with Portugal, though, didn't we? And that was on the green list, the watch list, and that's flipped uh, in a heartbeat. So that my question again is, would you book a holiday for your family to one of the Balearic Islands at the moment, given that it's on a watch list? Yeah. So actually, they were just on the green um, list. And, and the reason we've introduced the using this watch list category is to give people a bit more visibility uh, over it if we think things might move uh, quicker. Um, so, so sadly, I don't think I've got time at the moment to um, take a holiday. Um, but, um, uh, you know, if people are in a situation where uh, from uh, next week, from next Wednesday, Thursday, uh, they wanted to get away, then this, these are the places where you can go for the purposes of, of holiday of course, being aware of all the uh, caveats. Rob, that means having in the back of your mind what happened in Portugal. Yeah, and the difficulty is, I think, while the government say this is about transparency, about giving people uh, warning and about shifting it essentially to saying, look, you need to make your own choices, uh, I think people may think, well, if, if the minister won't tell me whether he would book a holiday in these circumstances, what am I supposed to do? And then I think the problem for business as well is what they wanted to see yesterday was some confidence injected back in the market after an absolutely dire 15 months. Uh, and I think they've kind of gone some of the way and said, look, you can go here, but then they've pulled back. So I think business will be asking this morning uh, and querying whether this really injects the confidence into the industry that they say they need. Matt Hancock? Yeah, I think questions this morning about a non-executive director who works in the Department of Health um, and Social Care. This is Gina uh, Colodangelo. Now, she took up this role as non-executive director in September 2020. Uh, we understand this is um, a paid role. Uh, and on the government website, it talks about her background in marketing and communications at Oliver Bonus, the um, High Street Lifestyle her husband uh, store. Her Bonus. husband uh, is very senior, I think, founded that um, as well. Now, she went to university around the same time as Matt Hancock studied the same topic. There has been allegations in newspapers before that they are friends, they knew each other from university. I think the precise nature of how she was appointed to that job is coming under the microscope uh, this morning. When you asked the Transport Secretary about it, he insisted everything was done by the book. In terms of uh, rules, anyone who's been appointed has to go through an incredibly rigorous process in, in government. Um, so whatever the rules are, the rules will have to be followed. There are no shortcutting. Uh, that is anyone who's had anything to do with the appointment system in the civil service knows. Uh, there, there are very st strict uh, rules in place. Yeah, I mean, the, we spoke to the Department of Health this morning. They say this appointment was made in the usual way and followed correct procedure. What exactly And also some is, time ago, I don't think it's a What is that recent... procedure? So uh, it depends on the specific role, um, but uh, people have to go through usually an, an interview process which involves an independent panel. Recommendations are then made to uh, ministers. Uh, depending on the type of role, uh, you'll get a, 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 a something called appointable or non-appointable uh, list, and then you make a decision uh, based on the qualifications of the uh, individual. So I don't think um, that uh, I, I, uh, I think it's a bit of a red herring in, in, in this case. I think it's really a, a, a personal story, and it's not. So I don't intend to comment on somebody else's uh, personal life. Now, while Gina Colodangelo was appointed in September last year to this non-executive directorship role at uh, the overall department, uh, she has been seen with Matt Hancock at interviews and around Parliament since before that. And if you look back at uh, a register of interests for uh, research assistants and members' secretaries, she is listed under her married name from February last year, with the sponsor on that database being Matt Hancock as well. So we've sent a number of questions to the Department of Health and Social Care this morning, asking what her precise responsibilities were in the department and how she came to be appointed prior to September 2020 and what her job was there. Uh, as yet, we haven't got any detailed answers, though.
And she does have AAA access to the building across the road, doesn't she, Palace so, of Westminster? So actually, the most recent register of um, interests for member secretaries and research assistants doesn't list her name, but in February 2020, she is listed under that, uh, and that register generally is for pass holders. So I think it's unclear at the moment whether she has full parliamentary pass access, but certainly in February 2020, there was involvement um, there with the department, uh, and directly the sponsor was the health secretary. OK. Um, Lots to think about. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, the public inquiry into the COVID pandemic. Let's talk about that. The government's planning for a major outbreak will be thoroughly examined, but countries around the world were caught out by COVID. And now Trinity College at the University of Cambridge wants to fund projects which help to identify and respond to emerging diseases, which could be the next pandemic, uh, pandemic, I should say. The Trinity Challenge was launched by England's former Chief Medical Officer, Dame Sally Davis, and she is with us now. Dame Sally, it's lovely to see you. Thanks so much indeed. I suppose my viewers this morning would think, well, why don't we do that already? Well, we have systems in place, but the WHO did point out that the world was unprepared. And what I and friends, as this pandemic unfolded, thought was that a lot of data that would help us identify, respond and recover from pandemics better is held by the private sector. Behavioural data. Are we moving around? Are we spending money? Our attitudes. Meanwhile, data science has moved on immensely and many of the very best are in the private sector. So we set out nine months ago launching a charity with colleagues to bring together a collaboration of private sector, many of the data companies and insurance companies from around the world with top academics from around the world to try and see if by launching a public challenge, we could bring together innovative minds with this data that's already collected to do these things and do it better. And this afternoon, I'm going to open the envelopes and announce the winners from our pledged £5.7 million pot. And I can tell you the finalists are so exciting. They will be helping the world go forward. In what way? Can you give us any clues? Well, I can tell you some of the things in the finalists. They bring in how to use in Southeast Asia, farmers as disease detectives, using things like blockchain to make sure that as vaccines are rolled out around the world, they, we know where they are, they're not wasted, they're not spoilt using data on behaviours to see whether people are vaccine hesitant and what messages work with what communities. So a real variety of things. And I have to thank our 42 members who have really helped the, ac the academics and the data companies in taking this forward. Oh, I can't wait to hear more about that. Southeast Asia farmer detectives, that sounds Fascinating stuff. Um, talk to me about why you think at the capital doesn't have enough uptake on people being vaccinated. Well, uh, we've always had lower levels of vaccination in London and it is to do with people being um, more deprived. Um, we need to get to them and talk to them in different ways. And the best people to talk to them are their own community. And interestingly, the church has been reaching out to other faiths and faith leaders have done a very good job. Our public health colleagues in London, in those boroughs, know what needs doing and they are working with the communities. But you have to do it community building up. It, you can't just do it from um, organising and admonishing from the top. Okay. This is about belief systems. Okay. Yeah. Now, we know the health benefits of double jab, but what should be the social benefits, in your opinion? Huh. Um, I thought I was talking about innovative science and science coming to the rescue of society. Um, I think there should be some social... Well, there are some social benefits. Those of us of my age who've got both feel able to follow the government guidelines and meet people in the garden and outside. I have to say that for all the double jab gives you a lot of protection, it isn't total protection. So we have to go on washing our hands, social distancing, 
I think the evidence on mask wearing is very strong. So I'm being very careful and I'm going to go on being very careful. So you're going to carry on wearing your mask, even though we had some ministers actually on the show who've said that they won't uh, do that. It's, it's a, a personal choice from the 19th of July, as we know. Given what we know now and the research that's been done and, and the event that you will be unveiling the uh, winners of later on today, do you think that we could ever find ourselves in the same position again where a global pandemic brings the, the world to its knees? Of course we could. And that's why I've launched the Trinity Challenge. We need to prepare better. We need to use another example from our finalists is sensors of sewage and of air that can pick up pathogens and then wireless um, the results to a distance so you can put them in poor communities. We really have to think about how we put in place surveillance and how, how and the government led on this through the G7, we get that 100 days from the genomic sequence to having a vaccine. We've made great strides. We've got a lot more to do. Which, I mean, if you're looking back, because 2020 hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? What one thing could we have done differently to have protected our communities sooner? I expect the investigation will sort that one out. But personally, I would have gone for masks earlier and I will go for a mask myself longer. OK, and just while I've got you, I know that what you came on to talk about and hopefully you agree that we've, we've talked about that in some detail, but I know that you previously uh, campaigned uh, heavily for a crackdown on uh, junk food ads. Um, we're, we're now hearing that the government plans to ban the ads before 9pm. Are you chalking that up as a victory? I never see things as a victory for me, but it is a victory for the country that at long last we're learning there is no magic bullet to solve obesity, and yet we've got to solve it. Obesity gives you inflammation, and they were the people who were most at risk of dying, along with people with other comorbidities. We've got to do it, and I'm so pleased we're making movements. Uh, just before you go, Dame Sally, how are we going to learn more about uh, this afternoon's events? Did you, will you have a gold envelope and open it? How does that work? Absolutely. We're having an award ceremony. Do uh, go onto our website, thetrinitychallenge.org, and watch, and you'll see the great winners. They are so exciting. Well, I really hope that we'll be able to have some of them on the programme next week. But for now, Dame Sally, it's lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Like that. Thumbs up, quick look at the sport for you now. Here's Rob. Hi, Rob. Good morning. Good morning to you, Kay. England's cricket is missing a few big players, but another victory last night. Let's have a look at some of the best of the action, shall we? This sports bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Committed to getting 100 million people 20% more active by 2025. This is perhaps the most iconic sporting image of the 20th century. Tommy Smith on top of the podium and John Carlos on the right raising their fists to protest against racial injustice at the 1968 Olympics. The gesture during the medal ceremony changed their lives. This is the inside story of division, the fight for equality and redemption. It was a joyous occasion. For me, after the races were over, I felt like now I'm here to get busy to do what I came to the games to do. I was extremely proud of these courageous and committed athletes. It was a damn gutsy thing to do. Nobody had any idea what was going to follow, but nobody thought good things were going to happen. They felt that we was a cancer to society, you might say. Throughout the 1960s and leading up to the 1968 Olympics, many sportsmen and women in the USA were grappling with how to reflect social and political injustices. For John Carlos and Tommy Smith, October the 16th, 1968, would become the day they chose to make a statement and send a message. Even in the context of the entire 20th century, 1968 was a turbulent year. The Prague Spring in the former Czechoslovakia the Tet Offensive, a turning point of the Vietnam War. Student killings in Orangeburg, South Carolina by police. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. Senator Bobby Kennedy, brother of President John F. Kennedy, is murdered. Dozens 
are killed protesting in Mexico City 10 days before the Olympics begin. And then, on October 12th, the Games themselves begin. This moment, this image, almost never happened. Well, I actually wanted to boycott, but, you know, personally, I wanted to boycott. Uh... Committed to getting 100 million people 20% more active by 2025. Former Chancellor George Osborne is to become the next chair of the British Museum. He says he's thrilled, but he'll take the job at a time when the museum is coming under increasing pressure to return hundreds of artefacts to countries including Greece and Nigeria. Talking about it in more detail should be Geoffrey Robertson QC, who once described the trustees of the British Museum as the world's largest receivers of stolen property, and Jacob Reynolds from the Academy of Ideas and the organiser of Debating Matters. Hello to you both. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Uh, let's go to you uh, first, Geoffrey uh, Robertson QC, if we may. What should uh, he be returning as soon as he takes office, in your opinion? Good morning, Kay. I think he should be returning those items of cultural heritage that have been stolen in colonial wars, often with a killing of men, women and children, but denying the inspiration to future generations of the great artists who lived and worked in their country. Now, I would begin with the Parthenon marbles, which were ripped off the temple walls of the Parthenon by Lord Elgin's workmen after he had paid enormous bribes to the Turkish officials who should have been stopping him. Uh, they belong to Greece, and there's a beautiful museum beneath the Parthenon itself where they can be seen this greatest wonder of the ancient world that is still, to a large extent, extant. Uh, it can be seen under the blue attic sky where it belongs and not in the gloomy uh, Bloomsbury Gallery to which half of it has been consigned. So that would be a great start and it would be, I think, applauded around the world. Then you have, of course, the Benin bronzes, those extraordinary pieces of art which were looted by the British Army in 1897. They killed the men, women and children. They then took them back and they were sold around the world. President Macron has ordered the French galleries that exhibit them to send them back to Nigeria. Uh, and it's rather embarrassing to be led in morality by the French. Ah. So uh, there are items like that. But he okay. should keep uh, the Rosetta Stone which Egypt wants because the marble of the Rosetta Stone that's deciphering the key to an ancient language was done in the British Museum when it was there. Okay. So uh, it should keep that. OK, lots to go out there, Jacob. Uh, we should return uh, most, it was certainly uh, to Nigeria, we should re return the uh, Benin bronzes to Nigeria and we should uh, return the Elgin marbles to Greece. Yeah, I think nobody denies that these uh, artefacts have the checkered histories, but the demands to return them are, I think, quite damaging to an important idea and an important ideal, which inspires visitors of these museums in their millions every year, which is that these aren't the parochial achievements of particular cultures or particular people in particular places, but these tell a part of the story of the achievements of humankind as such, and that's how those uh, these artefacts can currently be appreciated, and that the demands to return them, secondly, these demands, I think, often have a lot more to do with offering opportunities for Western uh, political and cultural elites to engage in acts of moral grandstanding rather than being uh, particularly interested in the artifacts or the places to which they go. So I'm, I'm much, I much prefer to see them in these kind of like world museums rather than uh, trying to pigeonhole them as uh, either political footballs or as just parochial elements that only belong to one particular people. Jeffrey Robertson, QC? Well, Jake, Jacob's great idea is called colonialism. It's called finders, keepers, stealers, keepers. It is the 19th century idea of the kind of cult museum which has shows the superiority of the West with a smorgasbord of this and that. The greater idea 
is the idea of justice. Justice to people who were looted and plundered in the 19th century. That idea is that the great works of art can be appreciated not as a bit or a piece of some Western triumphalist museum, but as with others of its kind okay. together with the great achievement that you could see if the Parthenon marbles, not the Elgin marbles, the Parthenon marbles were reunited. OK, let's, Jacob, come in there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's obviously very easy and very um, tempting to engage in sort of sweeping statements like uh, referring to people who appreciate these elements of world culture as as being tainted by colonialism. And that says, I think, a lot more about the people who want to return these artifacts. And it's a great opportunity for, uh, with all respect to the QC, a great opportunity for people to engage in uh, this kind of moral grandstanding rather than uh, drawing attention to the either the real problems that exist in countries where these artifacts might be returned to, or in this case, appreciating these as, as the cultural treasures that they are. Your grandstanding, you Jeffrey Robertson. appreciation in Athens uh, beneath the blue attic sky, seeing the Parthenon marbles reunited, because it is the greatest wonder of the ancient world. Everyone, millions, would come to Athens to see them, uh, whereas in the British Museum, they're just a bit and a piece on the way to the Egyptian mummies and the uh, other attractions okay. of the museum. Let Jacob come in there. Yeah, I, I, I think that the... the there's an element of a uh, kind of dismissal of the people who go, as I say, and there are millions through these museums. No, I'm one of them. There are 80,000 members. Checking them when they see them they in a particular context, whereas I think the great thing about these museums is that they offer an opportunity to tell a really rich and exciting human story about the achievements of, of human culture as a whole. Sadly, we're out of it time, gentlemen, but that's a fascinating uh, conversation. And hopefully you'll come back and talk to us about it in more detail when George Osborne takes over at the British Museum. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. you hadn't thought about that, had you? There you go. Uh, quick look at the weather. I bet you thought about that for the weekend, as has Naz. Good morning, Naz. Good morning, Naz. Good morning. Looking pretty wet out there for today. Quite cold in the north too. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning. So for today, we are going to see a big drop in temperatures for northern areas of the UK. It's going to be a wet one this afternoon across southern and eastern parts of Scotland, particularly eastern Scotland and northern parts of England and Wales. Showers developing elsewhere in the south where it will be brighter and warmer, but mostly fine today for Ireland and Northern Ireland.